Coming up on Doctype, jQuery 1.5 has been released, and we're going to show you what's new in the JQ. Then, Nick's going to show you how to breathe new life into your designs with responsive web design. So put on your socks and sandals, because it's time for Doctype. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that's absolutely terrified of code, or a developer who thinks the golden ratio is a fast food combo meal, Doctype has the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help make you that guy. Heck yeah. So Jim, what's going on with Google Chrome? Well, Google has released a few new features from their beta branch into their stable branch, which is the sort of normal branch that we all use. One of the most exciting things is WebGL, which allows us to do 3D uh, programming in the canvas using an OpenGL Lite implementation. So we're going to start seeing probably a little more 3D game stuff coming along now that it's really distributed in a widely used browser. So maybe soon our browser will run Crisis. Very cool. <laughs> And if you haven't heard, Bar Camp Orlando is back. It's going to be on April 2nd. I almost forgot there. April 2nd, 2011. It starts at 9.30 a.m., but you'll probably want to be there just a little bit earlier, uh, probably at like 9, if you want to sign up for a talk, which, of course, is highly encouraged. And also, it's at Wall Street Plaza in downtown Orlando. We'll see you there. Yep. For more details, uh, be sure to check out barcamporlando.org. Well, jQuery 1.5 was recently released, so let's go over some of the new features. Let's check it out. jQuery 1.5 has recently been released, and there's a couple of cool new features built right in. So let's just jump into it. The first thing is what they call jQXHR, and that's short for jQuery XHR. Actually, right now in the docs, sometimes it's referred to as JXHR and sometimes jQXHR. So Sometimes the links kind of go to the wrong place in the documents, but I'm sure they're going to fix that. I'm pretty sure they're going to go with JQXHR. But basically what this is is a uh, wrapper around the XML HTTP request object, which is used for AJAX. And what this allows them to do is they now have a much more standardized model for when we use the various AJAX methods available in jQuery. So whenever we use an AJAX method like get, post, uh, get JSON, or even the AJAX method, will now be returned a JQXHR object, which allows us to do a couple of cool things. Whereas before, we would define these success and error handlers in the parameters of actually calling the method. Now we can actually assign those handlers after we have initiated the method. So in this case, we can see that we're calling jQuery.get and saving the JQXHR object into the request variable. Then, later on in the code, we can use the dot .success message to add additional handlers waiting for the success of the AJAX request, or even the error condition. And what's really cool about this is if you attach a handler after the request is completed, it'll be called immediately, just like it had been completed, so it'll clean up a lot of the asynchronous code. In addition to those, we also get a lot of different methods applied to the jqxhr object to sort of standardize what the xhr object in jQuery looks like. So we get methods like abort and get all response headers, as well as the normal properties we're used to, like response text and response XML, and so on. What's really cool about this is it always uses a jqxhr object, regardless of the transport that's actually used in the background. So if it's using a script tag for, let's say, a JSONP request, it'll still have the same outward appearance, and so you shouldn't be able to tell the difference. Along with that comes deferred objects, which are a new API inside of jQuery, which works a lot like the jqxhr object. Pretty much what it allows you to do is it's good for asynchronous code where you may want to attach callbacks later on. So let's say we had some deferred method that returns a deferred object. Later on, we can call deferred.done and pass it a callback. And again, this will be executed when that deferred object is resolved, meaning it completed successfully or is rejected, which means there was an error. So we can use the done and fail, just like we used the success and error callbacks on the jqxhr object. In fact, the jqxhr object is a deferred object, and the success and error methods map to done and fail on the deferred object. We also have this dot then method, which allows us to pass a success and a fail callback, which allows us to string together our asynchronous code in a more organized way. 
One of the cooler methods is the dot when method. Let's say we have two different deferring objects here that we get from two different AJAX requests. Let's say there's some code we want to execute after both of them have completed. Well, we can use the dollar sign dot when method and pass it both of the request objects. That will return a new deferred object, which will complete when the other two are both completed, or it'll fail when one of them fails. So now we can synchronize those two asynchronous actions into one thing, and then use the then method like we would on any other deferred object, and this callback will only be called when both request1 and request2 have completed. Now there's also a lot of other cool performance improvements and small changes. Take a look at the jQuery change log to read more about it. Listen, you need a domain name. You know it, I know it, but where are you going to go get it? GoDaddy, that's where. If you're looking to drive viewers to your video content, then .tv domains are where it's at. .tv domains are perfect for podcasters, video bloggers, and anyone with something to say. And they're available now at GoDaddy.com. Heck, where do you think we got Doctype.tv from? So we know you all get your domains from GoDaddy, but whose code are you going to use? Enter the code Doctype3 when you check out and save an additional 10% off your entire order. Some restrictions apply see site for details get your piece of the internet at godaddy.com so responsive web design is a relatively new concept in the web design world that helps you solve the problem of just the increasing number of screen resolutions that you have to design your site for so here's kind of the dream world you have your big screen and then you have your tiny mobile screen and up until just around last year, a lot of people were designing sites so that they had their desktop version and their mobile version. In fact, that's how a lot of people still make their website. They have a separate mobile site. And that's really not the reality. The reality is you have all sorts of different screen resolutions, and there's more and more all the time. You have iPads, all sorts of different mobile devices. You have even consoles now that you have to worry about. There's netbooks and so on. So how do you approach this? Uh, one approach might be to just start designing a different site for all these different devices, but that's crazy. There's always going to be more. So a better solution is to use responsive web design. And responsive web design basically comes from this article from Ethan Marcote that he wrote for a list apart, and he coined the term responsive web design when he wrote this article back in May of 2010. And basically the idea of responsive web design is that you use media queries in CSS3 to make the same HTML work for a variety of different screen resolutions. So this is basically what a media query looks like when you're doing responsive design. And the thing we want to pay attention to here are the media features uh, max width. With max width, you can figure out the width of the page that your website is being displayed on. And that's really useful because then you can make adjustments based on that information. So, for example, this is thinkvitamin.com, which is a very popular blog you should check out. And when you make the page smaller, the design actually changes. So there you saw the navigation change. When you make it slightly smaller, you can see that the text of the featured article changes. It gets smaller. And then finally, you get down to a mobile site, which is good for iPhones or Android-like devices. So that's pretty cool, and it really helps with things like accessibility and just makes a better user experience across different devices. So what's the future of this? Well. I think that we're going to start seeing responsive web design used to create television interfaces. More and more people are hooking up their TV to a regular PC, and they want to watch things like YouTube videos, Hulu, Netflix, and all sorts of things. And none of these websites, at least in the browser, really have a great TV experience. They're starting to get there. There's YouTube's leanback experience. But I think we're going to definitely see more centralized interfaces for displaying all of this great video content on the biggest screen in the house. So that is it for this week. Until next time, be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype TV on Twitter. And if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of Doctype, send us an email at questions at doctype.tv. And if you subscribe via iTunes or RSS or YouTube, you'll never miss an episode of Doctype. So come on, why not? 
So until next Tuesday, remember that every great webpage starts with Doctype.